extinguish a blazing house in the nick of time, exposing the murders the fire was meant to conceal. A woman's death in her bathtub looks like an accident, at least at first. Investigating a reported suicide, police in New Orleans find certain details suspiciously out of place. Killers can be masters at disguising their crimes. Even when their victims are in plain sight, it takes a vigilant investigator to realize that first impressions are often dead wrong. saw smoke rising from a house just before dawn. The firefighters battled the blaze for several hours before bringing it under control. The patterns of the burns and the speed at which the fire spread told them this was arson. Had the motorist not called when he did, the house and all it contained would have been destroyed beyond recognition. The fire team was not in time to save the family who lived there. Four people, including two small children, were dead. But once the smoke cleared and smoldering ruins were examined, it became apparent that this family did not die in the fire. Downstairs, Teresa Hodges had been strangled. Upstairs, 11-year-old Winter Hodges and 3-year-old Anna Hodges had been shot. In the master bedroom, the body of their father, Blaine Hodges, was found with a single gunshot to the head. A 22 caliber pistol without a barrel lay near his body. Special Agent Barry Cassie of the Virginia State Police had a theory about what happened. It was pretty obvious that the evidence was just screaming. That's the words I use of uh, murder-suicide. And as the morning wore on, it became even uh, more evident that it was a murder-suicide. Blaine Hodges had recently been convicted of embezzling from his employer, the United States Postal Service. Police believe that Blaine, despondent over his impending prison sentence, had killed his wife and his children. Then he doused their home with fuel oil, set it afire, and shot himself in the head. At autopsy, Dr. David Oxley, deputy chief medical examiner of Western Virginia, began to doubt the murder-suicide theory. Well, when I examined the bodies, all four of the bodies, I noticed the thing that struck me was that the man, Blaine Hodges, had been dead considerably longer than the other three. The body of Mr. Hodges was quite decomposed. The other bodies were not. What do we know so far? Oxley told Special Agent Cassie that Blaine Hodges couldn't have killed his family. He died at least 12 hours earlier than they did. The gun collected at the scene also raised questions. The bullets retrieved from the victims were all 22 caliber, the same as the pistol retrieved next to Blaine Hodges. Went to the, microscope. the pistol's serial number had been filed off, making it impossible to trace. Its missing barrel also hampered investigators. 
A gun barrel leaves spiral marks called lands and grooves on every bullet that passes through. The bullets recovered from the victims had these markings, meaning they came from a gun with a barrel. Forensic supervisor William Conrad of the Virginia Division of Forensic Science was convinced that someone besides Blaine Hodges must have pulled the trigger. With the barrel removed and rifling being present on the, on the father's bullet that was taken from his head would indicate right away that he could not have fired that shot. There's no way he could have shot himself in the head and then removed the barrel. That wouldn't have happened. Conrad wasn't convinced this was even the real murder weapon. The bullets taken from the bodies were marked with six lands and grooves. Reference manuals for the gun found at the crime scene showed its normal pattern would be eight lands and grooves. Conrad concluded the gun found at the crime scene was merely a drop gun intended to fool the police. At a crime scene, if you're trying to frame someone or try to cover something up, you would drop a gun that's unrelated to the incident uh, and try to uh, uh, trick us into thinking that was the actual weapon. What looked like a murder-suicide at the crime scene had morphed into plain murder in the forensics lab. Aside from tipping detectives off, the gun was of little use at this stage in the investigation. They had no suspects, no ballistics to compare, and apparently not even the murder weapon. All that detectives could be sure of was that someone else had killed the family, then tried to make it appear like murder-suicide. The killer had hoped the flames would consume the evidence. Detectives sifting through the ashes at the crime scene now had a new assignment to smoke out the killer. Police had no idea who killed the Hodges and their two daughters. They questioned friends, hoping to gather clues about their enemies. Their closest friend was a man named Earl Bramblett. He frequently stayed with the family. The kids called him Uncle Earl. Police asked Bramblett to come to the station and talk with them. He seemed genuinely upset about the deaths. But in the course of his interview, an offhanded comment caught investigators by surprise. He uh, spontaneously made a comment and he said that sorry SOB he had a beautiful family he did them and did himself well at that moment I knew Mr. Brandon was probably involved in the murders of, of the Hodges family I knew that in order for somebody to know that outside of the police that they would have had to have been in there when the murders occurred the media hadn't reported the murder-suicide story, and the police hadn't mentioned it to anyone outside of the force. Bramblett had revealed a detail only the killer would have known. Cassie kept his suspicions to himself. He needed more evidence before he could act on them. Bramblett agreed to come in for another interview later. When he failed to show, the police went to the motel where he was staying, since he had no fixed address. When he didn't answer the door, the detectives obtained a room key from the motel manager to make sure he was all right. Bramblett arrived just in time to stop them. Now belligerent, he dared them to place him under arrest. To the police, he was behaving like a man who was guilty. You want to arrest? You think I've done something wrong? Who believed the police would never be able to prove it. Bramblett's own words had made him a suspect, but words alone proved nothing. Three days after the Hodges family were killed, police set up a roadblock in front of the house. The fire had started around 4.30 a.m. By stopping cars around that time, they hoped to find someone who may have passed the house just before it burned. A woman told police she saw a vehicle pull out of the Hodges' driveway at the time of the fire. She noticed the vehicle because it was so unusual. An old white pickup truck with a black tailgate. She did not notice the license number 
or the driver. Earl, said we'd be back. A search warrant to look at your truck and your room. Can I read it? While the roadblock was taking place, police returned to Bramblett's motel room with a search warrant. As Bramblett stood by, they searched for anything that might suggest his involvement in the deaths of Blaine Hodges and his family. Outside stood his white pickup truck with its distinctive black tailgate. In the front seat, police saw several 22 caliber shell casings. They were the same brand and caliber as the casings found at the murder scene. When the firing pin strikes a bullet, it leaves a distinct impression on the cartridge casing. William Conrad hoped to compare the casings from the crime scene with the ones found in Bramblett's truck. Once again, he found the killer was one step ahead of him. He'd obscured the marks on the cartridges. It looked like someone had placed it in, fired the gun, took them out, placed them again, and fired them. Again, this, it indicated that someone was trying to manipulate the evidence after the fact to try to confuse the laboratory and what was going on. Conrad would not be so easily thwarted. Among the hash of wayward marks, he looked for similarities between the cartridges retrieved from the truck and those from the murder scene. We can put the marks together, see the reproducible patterns that are present, and be able to say that the marks that you see represented on both of them were made by the same firing pin impression. After close scrutiny, he found what he was looking for. One of the cartridges from the crime scene had a strike mark identical to a cartridge from Bramblett's truck. And I found enough of those individual characteristics that I was able to say that both of them had been fired uh, by the same firing pin uh, to the exclusion of any other. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The cartridge casings were definitely used in the same gun, linking the drop gun to Bramblet. But that wasn't enough. Conrad still needed to find the gun that fired the fatal bullets. Meantime, detectives worked the case from another angle, trying to find out if Bramblett could have been the one who set the fire. The killer had torched the house around 4.30 a.m. on Monday, August 29th. To check Bramblett's whereabouts at that time, police went to the sign company where he worked. They learned he was scheduled to be at work at 5 a.m. the day of the fire. The same employee that routinely checks the time cards checked uh, Mr. Bramlett's. Mr. Bramlett's card had been obliterated. Uh, that the time that he punched in on Monday morning, August the 29th, had been blacked out where you couldn't read what time he might have punched in. Police called on handwriting expert Gordon Menzies to find out what was under the marking. Using uh, infrared lighting techniques, I was able to separate the ink of the overwritten entry or the obliterating entry and come up with an entry of 508 M, uh, which was apparently eight minutes after five Monday. The time card confirmed that Bramblett arrived at work after the blaze was set. But that didn't prove he was the one who set it. It only proved he had time to do it. The search for more evidence continued. Bramblett's employer told police that the morning after police searched Bramblett's motel room, Earl arrived at work seething with rage. One hour later, a co-worker noticed water running under a door. He found a pair of blue jeans thought to be Bramblett's. They smelled of the solvent used at the sign company. 
The manager thought them important enough to turn over to the police. Authorities hoped the genes still held some clue to link Bramblett to the fire. Scientists analyzed them and the water they were soaking in. To identify the chemicals in the fabric, the genes were placed in a canister with a solvent called pentane. After they had soaked for 15 minutes, the pentane was poured off. The solvent evaporated under a fume hood, leaving behind a soup of the compounds from the genes. The liquid was placed in a gas chromatograph. A readout identified each compound soaked out of the genes. One was a commercial solvent used by the sign company. The other was fuel oil, like that used to douse the home of the murder victims. Investigators believe that Bramblett had tried to rinse the oil-soaked genes clean carelessly leaving them where anyone could find them. Though the genes were potential evidence, they were, like everything else so far, circumstantial. Investigators pressed on. Hoping that Bramblett's carelessness didn't stop there, they looked for more evidence in the dumpster at the sign company. Along with documents belonging to Bramblett, they found a t-shirt bearing the words William Byrd High School, class of 2001. One of the murder victims, 11-year-old Winter Hodges, owns such a t-shirt. It was missing from the crime scene and unaccounted for. The shirt found in the dumpster had apparently belonged to the victim. Investigators were encouraged. Only Bramblett would have had access to both the shirt the dumpster. Still, it proved no wrongdoing. As the investigation into the deaths of the Hodges continued, Bramblett left town for good. Though Virginia police never let him out of their sight, they believed they had nothing to hold him. They didn't realize they had what they needed all along. Police were reasonably certain that Earl Bramblett killed the Hodges family. But that means nothing in a court of law. To prove it, they had to place him at the scene. The gun seemed to be the crucial element. They just didn't know how it fit. The killer had taken pains to make sure the weapon couldn't be identified. Without a serial number, it couldn't be traced. Without a barrel, Investigators had no way to perform a ballistics test. They had no reason to believe that the gun from the crime scene was the murder weapon. According to William Conrad's reference manual, a bullet fired from this gun would show eight lands and grooves. The bullets recovered from the Hodges showed only six. The weapon sat on a shelf for a year while the case against Bramblett stalled. Then, on an unrelated investigation, Conrad ran across a weapon of the same brand as the gun in the Bramblett case. He test-fired the gun and was surprised to find that the bullets had six lands and grooves instead of eight. The reference manual had been wrong. Conrad now knew that the gun found in the Hodges house most likely was the murder weapon. The killer had removed its barrel because he thought it would make the gun untraceable. But through the cartridge casings and other forensic evidence, police found their man. By linking the gun to Earl Bramblett, the police had gathered the final piece of evidence they needed to prove he was the killer. Then, his sister in Indiana provided information about the possible motive. Bramblett, apparently feeling threatened, had sent her a huge number of audio tapes for safekeeping. He told her to send them to police if something happened to him. When she heard her brother was in trouble, she forwarded them to the Virginia authorities. In his audio tape diaries, 
Bramblett spoke of his more than casual attraction to the Hodges' 11-year-old daughter. Bramblett had once been a suspect in the disappearance of two small children, but his involvement had never been proved. According to the tapes, Bramblett began to believe that Blaine Hodges, faced with prison for embezzlement, had become a police informant. In his delusions, Bramblett had decided Blaine was using his daughter to entrap Bramblett as a child molester. The police believed that on Saturday, August 27, 1994, Bramblett had been visiting Blaine at his home. While Teresa Hodges and her children were out shopping, he took his 22 Magnum pistol and shot Blaine in the head. According to friends who saw them later that day, Bramblett told Teresa when she came home from shopping that Blaine, despondent over going to prison, needed some time by himself. Like the good uncle he pretended to be, he bundled Teresa and the children into his truck and took them camping in the nearby mountains. As Blaine Hodges lay dead in an upstairs bedroom, his wife and children went off with his killer. They would have only a 24-hour reprieve. The next day, Bramblett would resume his killing by strangling Teresa Hodges. Having killed both parents, Bramblett saved his last horrifying act of violence for the children. He then put the murder weapon next to Blaine Hodges' body to make it appear that Blaine had killed his family, then himself. He was sure the fuel he spread throughout the house would ignite an all-consuming fire, that the police would buy the theory of murder-suicide. But Bramblett had no sooner made his getaway than a passing officer spotted the flames and called the fire department. Special Agent Barry Cassie acknowledges that Bramblett almost got away with it. His primary plan was if the police buy this murder-suicide, I'm home free. And look, he would have been home free. But see, he did not know that the Benton Fire Department had responded in such a short order that they preserved the bodies upstairs. It took the police almost two years to build their case. Bramlett had relocated to South Carolina, but the Virginia authorities had never lost his trail. He was arrested in July 1996, convicted of four counts of murder and sentenced to death. Killers can disguise their crimes in many ways, but the truth often lies just below the surface. On April 29, 1997, Police in the suburban Philadelphia community of Marion, Pennsylvania, arrived at the house of Craig Rabinowitz. He'd called 911 to report his wife unconscious in the bathtub. They found Rabinowitz clutching his wife, Stephanie, still in the tub where he'd found her. He told police he'd discovered his wife on her side, her head underwater. He had no idea what caused his wife to drown. Paramedics tried to revive her, but she was dead. Detective Charlie Craig saw no signs of foul play in the death of Mrs. Rabinowitz. My initial impression of the cause of death after looking at Stephanie, after viewing her at the emergency ward, and after talking with the emergency ward doctor was, that was an unexplained death or it was an accident. All right, here we go. What are you doing? Oh, come on. Friends and relatives <laughs> mourned the untimely death of a woman in the prime of life. Craig and Stephanie had met when he was a camp counselor and she was still a teenager. After they married, Stephanie went to law school and had a promising career as an attorney. To their friends, they seemed an ideal couple. Now, their happiness had come to a tragic end.
Craig told police that on the night of his wife's death, he was watching a hockey game while she took a bath. He heard a thump coming from the bathroom, like the sound of a shampoo bottle hitting the floor. When his wife failed to emerge from the bath after 35 minutes, he went to check on her. That's when he found her submerged in the water, her face blue. He tried desperately to bring her back to life, then called 911. Detectives have an eye for inconsistencies. And though they had no reason to doubt that the death was an accident, one fact seemed bothersome. The paramedics mentioned that the victim was wearing jewelry, including a watch. Charlie Craig's partner, Detective Richard Peffel, asked some of his female friends if they bathed with their jewelry. And almost exclusively, every woman said, absolutely not. The first one I did was the first night I got home about 4 a.m. and I woke up my wife from a dead sleep. Nance, if you took a bath, would you wear all of your jewelry? And she looked at me and said, no, why? And I said, don't worry about it, go back to sleep. That eccentric detail motivated investigators to look for other inconsistencies. They checked the hospital records. Again, something didn't sit right. After death, a body's temperature normally drops at the rate of one degree per hour, even faster if it's sitting in water. When the victim arrived at the hospital, her temperature was only one degree below normal, indicating she died just 10 minutes before the call to 911. Her husband's estimate that 35 minutes passed after he heard a thump in the bathroom didn't add up. While detectives' suspicions were mounting, Chief Coroner Halbert Fillinger requested an autopsy to find out why the healthy 29-year-old died so suddenly. Craig Rabinowitz refused to allow it, asserting that Jewish law demands that the body be interred before sundown the day after death, and it must remain intact. But in cases of mysterious or sudden death, the coroner can overrule religious objections unless he's given a court order. Because of their Jewish faith, Stephanie should have been buried before the next Sunday. And Dr. Fillinger was pressured by the family to release Stephanie's body so that she could be buried in accordance with her faith. And Dr. Fillinger was persistent that the body would not be released until a complete autopsy was committed. When the body was brought in, it showed no marks, not even a bruise to indicate how the victim fell. According to Fillinger, that's not unusual. There are injuries on the front of the body, and they occurred just prior to death or a short time prior to death. And you examine the body right after death, you may not see anything at all. But by the time the autopsy was conducted, 12 hours after she died, the victim's wounds began to reveal themselves and the truth about her death. The medical examiners believed they were about to begin a routine autopsy on the victim of a mysterious death. Though the circumstances were tragic, examiners didn't expect them to be criminal. But they soon found themselves face to face with homicide. The first indication of foul play came with a look at the skin below the victim's eyes, where bruises made a silent accusation. And as the blood drains away from those sites of injury, leaving the surrounding skin quite pale, then the area of bruising stands up like a beacon in the night. Bruises such as these come from lack of oxygen, most often when a victim chokes or is choked. Strangulation was a possibility worth looking into. The victim showed no external marks around her neck, but beneath the skin, the tissue damage confirmed Fillinger's suspicions. And of course, when we first got the body open, we found the evidence of uh, severe strangulation, a great deal of trauma in the neck. The mystery of Stephanie Rabinowitz's sudden death had been solved, and a homicide investigation had begun. Detectives Charlie Craig and Richard Peffel, along with prosecutor Bruce Castor, had their prime suspect, the victim's husband, Craig Rabinowitz. 
They questioned him in the presence of his attorney. When Charlie came back in and advised both Rabinowitz and the attorney that Stephanie had in fact died from manual strangulation, the attorney jumped up and said, oh my God, she strangled herself. And both Charlie and I looked at the attorney and I said, I don't think so. The Rabinowitz marriage seemed picture perfect. What could have driven Craig Rabinowitz to kill his wife? Police obtained a warrant to search the house for some sign of a motive. While his wife worked as a lawyer, Craig had supposedly run a business from his home. He convinced a number of his friends to invest in his promising venture. But a search of the house showed no evidence of a business being conducted there. Detectives had almost given up when one of the officers found a plastic bag in a crawl space above a closet. The bag was filled with receipts and financial records. They revealed that Craig Rabinowitz had been living a lie. When we went through the bag, we found some pretty important items, including a list or a ledger. We also found other receipts from pawn shops, indicating that some jewelry had recently been pawned. And we also found receipts from furniture stores, the furniture that he had bought, apparently another woman. So during this whole case, he was pictured to be this loving, happy, devoted husband. And in this bag, we found otherwise. A forensic accountant, skilled in deciphering complex financial transactions, reviewed the records. He found that what Craig had called a business was in fact a con game. He'd swindled his investors and convinced his trusting wife to remortgage their home. He then spent the money, not on business, but to support his secret life. Credit card bills totaling $54,000 came from a single location, a strip club in Philadelphia. He'd been seeing one of the dancers there, showering her with gifts. At the time of his wife's death, Craig was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Desperate for money, Craig had taken out two insurance policies, each for one and a half million dollars. One was for his own life, the other for his wife. In a ledger found in the attic, Craig had calculated his net worth in the event his wife died, proving the crime was premeditated. After collecting on the insurance and paying off his debts, he'd have $1.2 million to spare. At the end of his rope, Craig turned on his unsuspecting wife and strangled her to death. He filled the bathtub hoping to create the appearance of an accidental drowning. Then he called the police. It seemed like such a simple plan. According to Charlie Craig, far too simple. A lot of people said to me, you know, this guy must have seen this in a movie or read it in a book. Well, as it was coming close to trial, that kind of stuck in my mind. And I got the photos back out, because I remember there was some book that had something to do with death. A book on Rabinowitz's desk had looked out of place when police searched his home. The author claimed that few deaths are followed by an autopsy. Craig Rabinowitz was a con man. When he learned this information, that only 13% of the deaths are autopsied, Craig Rabinowitz was playing a con. He was playing the odds when he learned that information, that the odds were dramat dramatically in his favor that Stephanie wouldn't be autopsy. But an autopsy had been performed, exposing Craig Rabinowitz as a con man who'd gotten in too deeply. For murdering his wife, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Lurid 
events take on a life of their own. On the streets of any town, people love a good scandal, especially when it involves respectable citizens. In New Orleans, a town not easily shocked, investigators found themselves in the middle of a scandal that made the Big Easy a little queasy. Just after dawn on January 22nd, 1984, 62-year-old Aaron Mintz frantically summoned his neighbor, a doctor. Mintz explained that his wife had just shot herself. The two men rushed upstairs to the master bedroom. There, the doctor found Pam Mintz lying face up on her pillow, a bullet hole in the right side of her head. In her hand, was a pistol. The doctor checked for vital signs as Mintz waited anxiously nearby. Solemnly, the doctor informed Aaron Mintz that Pam Mintz, the woman he'd been married to for 33 years, was dead. The doctor called the police to notify them of the suicide. They arrived to make a report. Detective John Dillman led the investigation. Shortly before daybreak, or right at dawn, uh, I received the call of a suicide at the residence of Aaron Mintz. Uh, proceeded to that location, thinking that I was going to handle a suicide. Investigators assessed the scene, expecting nothing out of the ordinary. But the position of her body didn't look right. They suspected the victim had been moved. Pam's right elbow was bent in an upwards direction, like this, with two blood stains on her, the bottom of her forearm coming up to a point on both sides. Uh, I questioned those stains as soon as I saw them, because as we all know, blood can't run uphill. It's against gravity. The angle of the gun in the dead woman's hand also aroused the investigator's suspicions. It looked as though it was placed in her hand after the fact. Uh, the gun was positioned, and this is unloaded by the way, uh, the gun was positioned in her hand, bent in this position, close to her head, where it would have been almost impossible to pull the trigger except with a thumb. Uh, the gun was clutched very loosely, indicating to me that the arm had been, which had originally been lying on the bed, had been bent at the elbow and raised into that position, and then the weapon had been placed into her hand to make it appear to be a suicide. Beginning to doubt that this was truly a suicide, detectives looked for other signs of foul play they found blood smeared on the bathroom light switch. The victim, who died instantly, couldn't have left it. And by his own admission, Aaron Mintz was the only other person in the house. But even that discovery paled in comparison to what detectives discovered next. In another bedroom, they found a pillow with a bullet hole in it. On one side were powder burns. The other side was flecked with blood. Detective Dillman was convinced that the victim was murdered and the pillow used to muffle the shot. But once I followed this blood trail into the front of the house and found the pillow that was hidden, it didn't take a brain surgeon to, I mean, a big light just blew off, you know, John, this isn't a suicide, you have a murder on your hands. Police launched a full-scale homicide investigation. The case seemed open and shut. The immediate suspect was the victim's husband, Aaron. There had been no one else in the house. The alarm had not been tripped. Aaron Mintz was a prominent member of the community. He denied murdering his wife. 
Anxious to clear his name, Mintz agreed that same day to have his hands tested for traces of gunpowder and gunmetal. If he'd fired the gun, the residue would cling to his skin. But Aaron admitted he had washed his hands before the test was conducted. The results were negative. The test failed to prove Aaron killed his wife. But neither did it prove him innocent. Investigators turned their attention to the evidence collected at the house. They focused on the bloodied pillow found in the other bedroom and the switchplate from the bathroom. In 1984, when the crime occurred, DNA testing was not yet available. But the blood type matched the victims. Blood smears on the front and sleeve of Aaron's bathrobe also matched. Police theorized that blood got on the robe when Aaron rearranged the body. His sleeve probably touched the light switch when he went to wash his hands. All right, so you went downstairs. You relaxed, watched a little TV, and then fell asleep? Yes. And what happened then? It didn't take much digging for police to determine a possible motive. They learned that Mintz was having an affair with a young woman named Lois Porsche. Pam Mintz found out about her husband's infidelity two weeks before her death. She angrily confronted Aaron. She wouldn't let him go without a fight. She didn't want him embarrassing her in public. And when Aaron began showing up in the circles of their friends with the girl that he was having the affair with, she became irate. She was going to take him for everything he was worth. And he knew it. Investigators suspected that Aaron killed Pam so he could be free of the marriage without losing his fortune. According to their scenario, Aaron had gone to his wife's bedroom after she'd fallen asleep. He shot her in the head, using the pillow to muffle the sound so as not to alert the neighbors. That would have bought him plenty of time to rearrange the scene, making murder look like suicide. Mintz was charged with murder. To handle his defense, he hired prominent New Orleans attorney Michael Fowler. Like most of those who knew the accused, Fowler was surprised by his arrest. I would find it most unlikely uh, you know, that, that he would have been a, a subject of a homicide investigation. But th by the same token, I didn't know that he was having an affair. The case was sensationalized in the local press, which gave major coverage to the blood-stained pillow. In the court of public opinion, Aaron's guilt was a foregone conclusion. But in a court of law, the prosecution faced a serious challenge. You realized that you had an ability to win this case, but you had to do it in terms of the forensics. You had to be able to negate a, a bunch of different things. To clear Aaron Mintz, the defense relied on forensics to dismantle the prosecution's case, one piece at a time. A blood-stained bathrobe, a smeared light switch, and a bullet-pierced pillow. This was the evidence presented in the death of Pam Mintz. I went upstairs and I found Palmer. We've been over this before. Mm -hmm. I know that. To the prosecution, it pointed to Aaron Mintz as a murderer. I saw my wife dead on the bed. But the defense oh, saw things differently. They began with Aaron's bathrobe, smeared with his wife's blood. Aaron claimed he'd been dozing in front of the TV downstairs in the early morning. Startled awake by a loud noise, he went to investigate. When he found his wife's body and the gun in her hand, his first reaction was to take her in his arms, hugging her. According to defense attorney Michael Fowler, this scenario also explains the blood on the light switch. After Aaron had embraced his, his wife, 
he turned the light on as he was exiting the room, made ex at every reason why there would be blood there. There was blood on the light switch in the bathroom. That made sense because at the point he went into the bathroom and washed his hands. The scenario explained away all but the most dramatic piece of evidence, the gunshot pillow. The prosecution argued that Aaron Mintz used the pillow to silence his gun, then removed it from Pam's bedside to conceal his crime. Again, the defense countered. Innocent of any crime, in a state of shock on discovering his wife's body, Aaron removed the pillow almost in a daze. He merely wanted to get it out of his sight without thinking how it might appear to police. It's only significant if it's a pillow that was used in a homicide. If it's not a pillow that's used in a homicide, it's like a dirty sock. What difference does it make? You know, it just, he just removes it. I mean, we all do crazy things when we're under a great deal of stress. The defense argued that since Aaron put the pillow where anyone could have found it, his purpose was not concealment. If he wanted to hide it, he could have hid it. There was a house that sort of was full of nooks and crannies and attic space and all, and he just put it in this other room. The defense was determined to discount the pillow completely. They stuck with the idea that Pam Mintz killed herself, but they asserted that the fatal bullet wasn't fired through the pillow. The defense had the pillow examined by Irving Stone of the Southwestern Institute for Forensic Sciences in Dallas. He set out to ascertain whether the fatal bullet was in fact fired through the pillow, as police had assumed. Using a weapon of the same caliber as the gun that killed Pam Mintz, Stone conducted tests to simulate what would happen if a gun were fired through a pillow into a human head. As a target, he used a sponge soaked in simulated blood within a heavy plastic bag. Stone shot the bag through the pillow from various distances. He demonstrated that if a pillow had been used to muffle the fatal shot, a great deal more of the victim's blood would have ended up on the pillowcase. What would have happened as the bullet passed through the pillow into the head, with the pillow being six to 10 inches from the head, then there would have been back spatter of blood that would have spattered back on the, the reverse side of the pillow. Well, there was none of this there. The blood on the pillow at the crime scene was hardly noticeable. By contrast, in the laboratory, the blood was spattered and stained over a wide area. Stone also showed that a bullet fired through a pillow would have left fragments of the pillow behind. You expect to find uh, cloth, fibers, some other type of uh, polymeric fill material at or around the wound and actually into the wound itself. I've seen where cloth fragments have been caught by the bullet and just carried right into the wound. There were no reports of pillow fragments on the bed where the victim was found. Likewise, the coroner found no traces of the pillow in the wound. For Stone, there was only one conclusion. The fatal bullet was not fired through the pillow. But a nagging question remained. What was the pillow doing there in the first place? On the one hand, we had no obligation to explain the pillow. Once we were able to explain it was not used in the in the in a murder in a homicide on the other hand it was there and we had to deal with it the prosecution had portrayed the victim as a wronged woman murdered so her husband could pursue his affair but the defense painted an entirely different picture they portrayed Pam Mintz as a vindictive woman with a long history of emotional distress her husband's betrayal had been too much to bear, the defense asserted. She plotted the ultimate revenge. She would kill herself, but in the process, she'd frame her husband for murder. The gunshot pillow would play a starring role. The Mince's housekeeper testified that she'd seen the victim leaving the house the day before she died carrying what appeared to be a pillow along with the dry cleaning. Earlier in the day, 
she'd seen a gun lying on Mrs. Mintz's bed. The defense suggested to the jury that Pam, out for revenge, fired a bullet through the pillow herself. Then she left it at her bedside as she prepared to end her life, knowing that it would appear that her husband had killed her. But there was no way to prove the victim had fired a pistol the day of her death. The police had made no attempt to test her hands for traces of gunpowder. Power believes this was a critical mistake. Despite the fact that she was then undergoing an autopsy, or was about to undergo an autopsy, and her hands had been bagged, the police lab never swabbed her hands, so nobody ever knew, and uh, to this day, they never know if there was any residue on her hands. They had every opportunity to do it, they just didn't do it. If a test had shown that Pam did not fire the gun, the police would have had clear evidence the case was not a suicide. If the test had shown Pam did fire the gun, it would have cleared Aaron of guilt. But Dillman thinks the test results might have been misleading. I did not order testing on a trace metal test on Pam Mintz's hand due to the fact that it, it really was irrelevant. The, we knew that the gun had been placed in her hands, metal had touched her hands, so any type of a trace metal test would have proved positive. That didn't prove anything. When the case went to trial, the prosecution was confident of the evidence it presented. But the jury found otherwise, accepting the defendant's version of what happened the night Pam Mintz died. The defense claimed she'd put a bullet hole in a pillow and placed it at her bedside as she prepared to end her life. In this way, she hoped to exact retribution on her husband from beyond the grave. But careful forensic analysis of the evidence had foiled her plot. Aaron Mintz was found not guilty in the death of his wife. If hiding the body is not an option, then hiding the crime is the next best choice. But a seamless veil of deception is difficult to weave. At a crime scene, investigators are always looking to challenge their own assumptions. A battery of forensic tests gives them the means to do it. Whether an alibi is grandiose or utterly simple, if it's based on a lie, it won't withstand close scrutiny. Time and again, killers who believe otherwise are proven 